knew I had that power. My name is Liz McGill. I'm the dean of the Stanford Law School, and I'm just delighted to welcome you here this afternoon to Stanford's Constitution Day lecture. All of you who are here probably know that we do a lecture each year hosted by the law school and the Stanford Constitutional Law Center uh, in order to commemorate the signing of the Constitution on this date in 1787. We all did not together experience a very long, hot, contentious summer leading up to the signing of the Constitution as the delegates in Philadelphia did, but we nonetheless have the right to commemorate uh, this special day. We uh, have this lecture at the law school each year and it's hosted each year by the Stanford Constitutional Law Center, uh, which is a center at the law school devoted to the study and research about all aspects of constitutional law. We love hosting this lecture. It's a chance for the entire Stanford community to think about uh, and be asked to think about uh, deep questions about the Constitution and constitutional law and constitutional interpretation. So without further ado, I'm going to turn uh, the lectern over to Professor Michael McConnell of our faculty, who is the faculty director of the Constitutional Law Center. Let me say one word about Professor McConnell. We're very lucky he's with us at Stanford. He joined us in 2009. Uh, he is a national and international expert on constitutional law, constitutional theory, it, with particular emphasis on the First Amendment, the religion clauses, theories of originalism, and other constitutional theories. He, as many of you in this room know, is a wonderful teacher of constitutional law and many other subjects, and came to us and has incredible practice experience in the field of constitutional law. He joined us after being a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit, and he's argued, I think to date, 14 cases in the United States Supreme Court on a whole range of topics. So we're incredibly lucky he's with us, and I'm going to turn it over to him to introduce our distinguished speakers. Uh, thanks, Liz, and uh, welcome many old faces uh, to constitutional uh, uh, Constitution Center events. It's great to see you back. And even more new faces, especially the 1Ls, um, I see sprinkled around. I know almost none of you yet, but we'll do something about that over the uh, course of the next uh, a few years. Um, it's uh, really a special pleasure, not just a privilege, but a pleasure to introduce our speakers uh, for this evening. Um, Mike Paulson is a very good friend. Um, I met Mike first when I was a lawyer in the uh, Solicitor General's office in Washington, and he was a summer intern uh, from Yale Law School, and I was sitting there in my office, and he pops in and wants to know if he could help me with a, a case that I was working on. Was that maybe Agostini uh, 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 against Felton? Grand Rapids versus Ball, yes, yes. And so, so here he was, and you know, interns are, you know, it's a, it's a mixed bag. Um, uh, he was great. We have been friends ever since. We are. He's the lead editor on the Constitutional Law Casebook that some of you will have inflicted uh, upon you, and that I'm uh, a contributor to. Um, and he has written on. Uh, an enormous range of, uh, uh, of subjects. Uh, but why today? Why here for Constitution Day? And the answer to that is that he and his son Luke, whom I first met when he was about three, uh, uh, I think, um, uh, have recently, what, just a few months ago, I think this hit the newsstands, completed a book which uh, is called The Constitution and Introduction. And uh, this was a, this was not just Mike, the law professor, writing and his son kicking, and this was a genuinely collaborative effort. Uh, I've been hearing about it for four or five years, I think. Uh, and so it really, this book weds uh, a sort of a, a scholar's technical understanding of the subject with an intelligent citizen's understanding of what we really want to know. And it's a remarkable book. 
Uh, I highly recommend it to you. And in fact, just in order to stimulate some interest in it, uh, I suggested that the Khan Law Center get some copies, and we're going to randomly distribute them to the luckiest four or five people in the room. So Judd, why don't you uh, take over that? All right. Um, the so first time the center is ever engaged in games of chance. Uh, so we'll see how it works. I hope it's legal in California. Uh, so one thing that's, that's not of chance is if you want to go buy this book, don't look at a Barnes & Noble within about 20 miles because I bought them all up this afternoon. Uh, but they'll be readily available on Amazon as well. Uh, so without further ado, I'll call out uh, a couple names. And if you're here, just uh, raise your hand and then walk on up. Uh, Mary Race. Matthew Greenberg. Anne Gassenbeck, Gassenbeek. You can hold your applause for the winners until the until the uh, debate is over. Carlo Dizon. Catherine Kelsch. My goodness, you're not doing very well, Judd. Carol Scow. Uh, James Banker. I'm delighted. Uh, Arnie Folkendell. Matt Bowman. Danielle Rios. Daniel Rios. Uh, Ralph Okren, Caleb Griscom, uh, the one else have an upcoming assignment, so you know who's not working on their brief. Uh, Brian Barron. Are you willing to give up your copy? Okay. So um, don't just put it on your shelf. Read it and share it with the others. And uh, every year in Con Law, I have students say, you know, what would be a good thing to read just as an introduction or an overview? And I always think, well, you know, there are a number of things. None of them are really very great. Uh, uh, now I'll have a, a recommendation. So in any event, that serves as sort of an introduction uh, Professor Michael Paulson from the University of St. Thomas, his son Luke, who is a recent graduate of Princeton in uh, computer science, humanities, and classics, now working for one of those small uh, tech companies in, in Mountain View. So he's really just, uh, speaking now to the 1Ls, he's basically exactly like you, except that he didn't go to law school but he's the one who wrote a book on the Constitution. <laughs> so, um, Michael and Luke, welcome. Well, thank you. You can guess which one I am. I'm the older one with the necktie and everything like that. It is an honor to be here at Stanford Law School. Um, I don't advertise this usually as part of my resume, but 34 years ago, for those of you who are first years, I can think I can sort of spot who the, where the 1Ls are hiding in the back. I was sitting, well not in those seats, but in the seats of Stanford Law School. I was a newbie, first year law student at Stanford Law School, but you guys are gonna accomplish something I never did. You're gonna graduate. I'm a Stanford Law School dropout. Um, and so I ended up, well you know, I was 22. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I ended up dropping back in and eventually went to law school at that uh, other, disreputable school on the other side of the country, the other small ones in southern Connecticut. <clears throat> um, but but I've, I've always wanted to return to Stanford where it all started and where I failed. 
you know, where I failed to, to go through. And, and it's, it's great to be here. It's a, it's a particular honor to be invited by my friend Michael McConnell. We've been friends for 31 years. It was summer of 1984 when I walked into his office. He took me to lunch. We've been friends ever since. We've litigated religious freedom cases together, filed a wealth of amicus briefs, exchanged drafts of articles been co-authors. I think he first met Luke when Luke was five. We went to his place in Utah and went camping in the desert with his family, and it was a great, memorable experience. That's a few years ago, but it, it's great to have a friend of 31 years, the type of friend you can, you can actually be candid with and say, I strongly disagree with your article. You know, say, say you know, say the things that only good lifelong friends can say to each other and be just completely candid and critical when need be. And it's an honor to be here with, with Luke, of course, uh, uh, to share the podium with my, my son. Uh, I should tell a little bit more about the story of the book, and then I'm gonna introduce the topic and then hand off to Luke. But uh, <clears throat> the idea for this book started, I was at one of these academic conferences. It's traditional, afterwards you all go out to dinner and start eating and drinking, sometimes to excess with each other. And I was giving one of these presentations at Princeton in winter of 2006, and at the dinner afterwards, the law professors in attendance and the college professors started an argument around about the second bottle of wine over when and where and exactly how students developed such misshapen ideas about the Constitution and constitutional law. And of course, the law professors try to blame the college professors. And the college professors say, no, it's not our fault. They came to us this way. You know, this is pervasive in the culture. This is taught in eighth grade civics class. And treating, teaching people actual sound concepts about the Constitution is, is really difficult undoing of so much of what's been ingrained upon people uh, for years and years and years. And I improvidently volunteered. I said, you know, somebody ought to write a book you know, aimed at either students or younger students or general public that just tries to set things reasonably clearly straight, that explodes a few myths and, and, and just presents a straightforward, not pointy-headed academic, but, but still tries to be an intelligent and sound description of the Constitution. They said, well, you know, physician, heal thyself, go do it. And the next day, I was flying back home and I was bumped from my flight in the Philadelphia airport and found myself with three hours of extraneous time on my hand. And so I went to a coffee shop and I sketched out, Luke, I don't, I don't think I told you I was gonna do this. I found the two page outline of the book from 10 years ago uh, that I sketched in the Philadelphia airport. It's now very heavily annotated. But you know, sort of laid out the idea of, you know, if you were to try to teach the Constitution in like a really short, compact, direct way, what would you include? I said, well, you need a chapter on the origins of the Constitution. And then you need a sort of a general description of its basic themes, and that's chapter two. And then you would need to describe the powers of the government, the various branches of the government. Uh, we have a chapter on slavery, and then chapter on the Bill of Rights. So we have five chapters that sort of comprise the first, the original Constitution, and then we have a second half of five more chapters. It's devoted to sort of a history of the Constitution's interpretation and implementation over time, covering the time periods from 1789 uh, to 2015. So that was the idea. I took it home that night uh, to my then 13-year-old son and told him about this idea, and he was intrigued. Now, he already knew at 13 a little bit of constitutional law. He would, he would regularly warm me up as I drive him to school, he'd warm me up for the day's teaching. What are you teaching today, Dad? You know, it's, we'd talk about it. I think he was the only 14 or 15 year old who knew and understood offensive non mutual issue preclusion. I also teach civil. Pro Child Protective Services was never notified. <clears throat> and they're probably worse forms of child abuse. But, the short of it is he'd had American history and government the year before, and he, we'd sort of share a good laugh about some of the things that he found in his textbook. You know, oh, huh, the Supreme Court invented the idea of judicial review in Marbury versus Man. You know, sort of the things only good law nerds could, could share with each other. 
And by the night's end, we had a plan of a one summer project of writing a short, simple, clear book on the Constitution. Well, we didn't finish it in one summer. One summer rapidly went to nine summers, and we did it exclusively as a father-son, part-time, summers-only project, sandwiched in amongst other things, wrote a lot of it at our cabin in northern Minnesota. And the book took shape over that time and gradually, of course, became more and more sophisticated as, as Luke did. And the way you kind of broke down the the writing project was I did the first drafts of the substantive sections, and he cured me of professor-itis, right? It, you'll notice as we give the presentations, he's laconic and straightforward and concise, and I go on and on and on and on, okay? And he, you know, he said, no, you got to get right to the point. The idea of this is to be clear. At the same time, you know, as he read more and more of the cases, and over time, we became genuinely more of a co-author sort of relationship. Finally, the book was actually published, and we're just really gratified. It's doing well in the reviews, and, so, and, and I'm really happy, Michael, that you invited us to, to do this kind of as a book event promo. And, and that leads into the topic for today. We're trying to figure out, okay, now how do you give a presentation with two people? Right, sort of awkward. We're going to be doing some handing off back and forth. And what we decided to do was to do something sort of like an update of the book. The book went to press in January of 2015. And some interesting things have happened since January 2015. The Supreme Court has had an interesting and really quite explosive uh, uh, term this year. And so we decided what we would do is kind of give you our first draft of the supplement if there were to be a supplement to this, sort of an update of some of the Supreme Court's most recent and provocative decisions of this past year, and to look at them through the lens of long-running historical constitutional controversies. Thus, our title, All This Has Happened Before. We chose that over you know, deja vu all over again, or there's nothing new under the sun, or, or something like that. The idea being just to capture the idea that many of today's supposed landmark, hot-button constitutional issues are echoes, or reprises, or extensions, or variations of themes that have been long-running constitutional controversies. So the outline of today's talk is we're gonna do sort of a countdown, four, three, two, one, of what we think were the most interesting and provocative Supreme Court decisions of this past term. And we're gonna look at each of them through the perspective of early controversies, uh, some of them you know, in the George Washington administration, that they are in many ways parallels to. So the four pairings are this. I'll just give you the overview. I have an outline because I despise PowerPoint. But you can see how well we're keeping on time. We're going to hand off back and forth to sort of a World Wrestling Foundation uh, uh, tag team sort of approach. Luke will talk about the issue of the scope of national government powers, which parallels the Bank of the United States controversy from 1789 and Obamacare. Then I'll come up and talk about the neutrality controversy of 1793 and how it relates to the Supreme Court's decision in a case called Zivotofsky just this last year. Then back to Luke, and we'll talk about another big enduring constitutional issue, First Amendment freedom of speech and press, and we'll parallel the Alien and Sedition Act controversies of 1798, 1799, and 1800 and see how they are paralleled in, in at least some, some small way by the Supreme Court's decision in the Sons of Confederate Veterans Texas uh, designer license plate case. And then we'll conclude with uh, the big kahuna of the Supreme Court term you know, uh, from this past year, the Obergefell versus Hodges case the same-sex marriage case, and I'll conclude with talking about that and how it parallels long-standing traditional controversies about what is the appropriate scope of judicial power. So if we stay on schedule, we'll talk about each specific controversy for only about six to eight minutes and leave time for questions, and that's when we'll both stand up here and banter back and forth and maybe argue with each other a little bit, which will 
uh, recall some of our conversations and deliberations as we are creating the book. So with no further ado, I hand off to my distinguished co-author, Luke Paulson. Oh, no. You, you can't clap every time one of us gets up here. <laughs> it's going to make things go too slowly. Well, I get the easy one to talk about. Um, the Bank of the United States and Obamacare. This really is a case where the modern dispute over Obamacare is a continuation of debates over federal government power that have been around since almost before the Constitution was adopted, and certainly since uh, 1789, when Hamilton and Jefferson had it, the first major dispute on this issue over the creation of a national bank. So to set the stage a little bit, the United States is just a few years old. Uh, Congress passes a law creating a national bank um, for financial reasons, need to get the new nation's finances on its feet. And the main architect of the bank is Alexander Hamilton, President Washington's Treasury Secretary. But Washington, and specifically uh, Washington's Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson, has some concerns about whether the bank bill is constitutional because the Constitution gives Congress power to regulate commerce among the several states and to make all laws that will be necessary and proper for carrying these powers into effect. Well, okay, so Congress has the power to regulate commerce. Does it have the power to create a bank? Jefferson is very suspicious of national government power. He thinks not. Hamilton is a big fan of government power. He thinks, no, that's fine. Jefferson's argument is the government will grow unchecked unless it's specifically limited to the terms set out in the Constitution. And that's true. Congress is given enumerated powers in the Constitution. They're specifically limited by what's written out in the document. And Jefferson says the bank is not necessary in a strict sense to regulate commerce. It's just something that would be nice, basically. Hamilton rebuts that argument by saying, no, there's no reason why we have to limit these terms to their narrowest possible meaning. Part of the reason for creating the Constitution in the first place is that a stronger national government was needed for the United States. And while it was important to the founders that the government remained limited, that it would not become just all powerful in the realm of politics, there was an intention to give Congress broad powers. And in this specific case, Hamilton says that necessary doesn't mean absolutely necessary. It means reasonable, reasonably related. And his formulation, which became kind of famous when the Supreme Court plagiarized it in a decision about the National Bank 20 years later, is that as long as the ends are legitimate, and that's Congress's power to regulate commerce, then any reasonable means toward those ends is constitutional. And so in this case, Hamilton argues that the creation of a national bank is constitutional, and Washington ends up agreeing with him. So much for the bank. Then it becomes a question through American history of how far can you push Hamilton's broad interpretation of the Constitution. What is necessary and proper to regulating commerce between states? For example, and this is a case from the New Deal era, can Congress pass a law that will prevent, um, that will regulate the production of wheat on a farm even though the wheat is just going to be eaten by the farmer and his family? And the Supreme Court says yes, that affects the market for wheat Therefore, it's necessary and proper to the regulation of commerce between states that Congress has the power to regulate even this instance of commerce. Well, okay, what if we push it yet farther? Can regulating commerce involve mandating commerce? Can Congress require someone to engage in commerce in order to correctly regulate a market? Well, now we're in 2012, 
this is the first of, and more important, of the uh, Obamacare decisions, NFIB versus Sebelius, where the, constitutional, uh, the constitutionality of the individual mandate is in question. Congress has required that all Americans purchase health insurance or they will be required to pay this penalty to the IRS. And the Supreme Court basically ends up saying, no, that requirement to purchase health insurance for people who weren't otherwise going to is not necessary and proper to regulate in commerce. And what I take this as saying is that the Supreme Court says, okay, we've gone this far, we've finally hit the limit that Hamilton thought the Constitution imposed on federal government power, which is not a strict interpretation, but just that there has to be a meaningful relationship between the law and the regulation of commerce, and that here there is no commerce to be regulated. So the Supreme Court concludes that no, it's not permissible for Congress. Congress does not have the power to compel people to engage in commercial activity. But Congress has other powers. And so the Supreme Court saves the Obamacare law by reading it as a tax rather than a requirement. The individual mandate is a tax on people who do not have health insurance, and that is within Congress's taxing power. And under that interpretation, the Supreme Court can find the individual mandate constitutional. The 2015 case, uh, King v. Burwell, is a follow-on to that. And it's not quite as interesting from a legal perspective. It's not about whether the Obamacare law was constitutional, but it's another instance of the Supreme Court uh, taking an interpretation of the law that is designed to save it. So in this case, uh, provision of the, the law provides funding based on having an exchange that's established by a state. And the court reads a law to say that this also means a state that would be established an exchange that would be established in the state by the federal government. So again, this, we're kind of cheating a little here. The, the issue that's really related to the Hamilton versus Jefferson debate is the 2012 case over the scope of federal power to regulate commerce. But it's tied to the current case, the 2015 case, by the fact that um, the Supreme Court, and in particular Chief Justice John Roberts, has taken this tack of being very deferential to the choices of elective branches of government, uh, Congress and the President, in their choice to pass a law and trying to understand this very complex law in such a way as to make it work. The idea that the Supreme Court is attempting not to intervene in the political process but to do whatever it was Congress wanted to do. You're up. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, now if Luke's talk, that first uh, constitutional controversy was about the scope and, and magnitude of the federal government's national legislative power. The next controversy involves sort of a parallel issue of the distribution of constitutional powers among the branches of the national government, and it involves the constitutional power over foreign affairs, which has been a perennial battleground between Congress and the president. And so our, our pairing of the old and the new there is Washington's Neutrality Proclamation of 1793, which, which you all remember from your history. But, 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 I'll, don't worry, I'll, I'll bring up the speed. With a fascinating little case uh, this year called Zivotofsky versus Kerry, which I love in part just because I like saying Zivotofsky. I think it's got a nice ring to it. Um, the specific issue presented in Zivotofsky is seemingly quite small. Can Congress require that passports of US citizens who are born in Jerusalem say Jerusalem, Israel, okay, and not just Jerusalem. 
The position of the administration has always been to straddle the issue of Jerusalem's sovereignty because it's a controversial international affairs issue. And so the US State Department policy was, let's just put Jerusalem and not specify Israel. So that's the small issue. It's like, you know, can you put the word Israel on the passports? Can Congress require it? The larger issue lurking behind it, the bigger principle involved, is the Constitution's allocation of the power of foreign affairs. Can Congress dictate something like this, where it arguably intrudes upon the president's foreign affairs uh, prerogative? And the right answer, if, if, if I may be so, so uh, bold, is I think that the president has the general power over foreign affairs as an aspect of the original meaning of the term, the executive power that's vested in the president. Uh, traditionally, the idea of executive power was understood to embrace more than just the execution of laws, but all aspects of the nation's external relations with other nations. The king had the traditional power of foreign affairs. Uh, war and peace, the framers' arrangement in the Constitution takes some of those specific powers of the king away and relocates them in Congress, most notably the power to declare war, authorize use of military force, and the treaty power is specifically shared between Congress and the Senate. But other than that, other than those exceptions, it seems that the traditional understanding of executive power embraced the general foreign affairs power, and that's still the default rule, as Jefferson, the Secretary of State, put it during the Washington administration, the transaction of business with foreign nations is executive altogether. And that brings me to the Neutrality Act, the Neutrality Proclamation of 1793. Basically, the story is this. Britain and France are ready to have their third major world war in 30 years. And the question is, will the US be involved? And the reason this is a problem is that Long ago already, Benjamin Franklin had negotiated during the American Revolution a treaty of amity and friendship and mutual defense with France. France came to our aid in the Revolutionary War. Since then, there's been a slight change in the French regime. A few heads have rolled. And the question is, are we bound by our treaty obligations to France to come to their aid in the Western Hemisphere in the war against England? President Washington, first in war, now wants to be first in peace, he thinks this is a terrible idea. America will get its butt kicked if it's in another war, and it's just really bad for the nation. So he has this question, do we have to do this? And again, it becomes an interesting question that he propounds to Alexander Hamilton, who defends Washington's decision not to, uh, uh, not to get involved in the war, okay? Washington issues a neutrality proclamation that says the U.S. is neutral in this, and he's attacked from the pro-France sides in Congress. It actually is Thomas Jefferson and James Madison again. And Alexander Hamilton writes a series of essays explaining the executive power in foreign affairs. They're called the Pacificus Essays, and it's probably the definitive explanation of the executive power in foreign affairs, and it's right along the lines that I sketched out. The president has the power over foreign affairs except where the Constitution specifically relocates it to someone else. So, President Washington can interpret the treaty with France, can suspend the treaty with France, can make executive agreements that are not treaties. Think Iran deals, okay? Um, and he defends broad executive power in these terms. Okay, fast forward to 2015 and the Supreme Court's decision in the Zivotofsky case. The right answer, I think, is that Congress cannot leverage its ordinary legislative powers to require the executive to put the word Israel on the passport. The Supreme Court reaches that decision in a majority opinion by Justice Anthony Kennedy. Uh, but it's just an absolutely terrible, incoherent, confusing, useless opinion. It's Kennedy and the four more liberal justices. It's the same block that actually decides the same-sex marriage case in favor of creating the liberal result of the same, uh, creating a constitutional right to same-sex marriage. There's a separate concurrence by Justice Thomas who I think is the only one who has the analysis right, and he parallels uh, pretty much what the, the Hamilton view was. And then the dissent by three uh, more conservative justices. Uh, 
The majority reaches the right outcome, <clears throat> but it's, as I said, analytically incoherent. The majority says there is no general presidential power over the conduct of foreign affairs. Well, I think that's just plain wrong. Then they go on to say, but our cases have nonetheless recognized a power of the president to recognize foreign governments. Well, where does the power to recognize foreign governments come from if it doesn't come from a foreign affairs general power? Well, the president has power to receive ambassadors. That's actually written in the text of the Constitution. But clearly, that doesn't give you a general recognition power. Um, then they say, this requirement to put Israel on the passport would interfere with the recognition power. The dissenters aptly ask, how? How does that interfere with the power to recognize Israel? They say, this, con this statute interferes. And this is also part of the opinion. I'm, I'm putting it in colloquial terms. It is better to have the president do this. It's sort of pure policy-driven balancing of interests, loosey-goosey with the text, and it leaves us pretty much at sea. Now, the dissenters, Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Scalia, Justice Alito, hold that an act of Congress can meddle with the executive's foreign affairs power. I think this is really quite extraordinary. Traditionally, the more conservative justices have been pro-executive power and pro-presidential power in matters of war and foreign affairs. And traditionally, the more liberal justices have been re, uh, sort of skeptical of power. Here, the positions of the conservatives and the liberals, as a rule, are exactly reversed. And it makes me scratch your heads. What's going on here? And, uh, can I be cynical just, just for a second? Well, why wouldn't I? Um, <clears throat> it appears that, you know, except for a few different votes of some justices, that the liberals wish to uphold the Obama administration position, something they probably wouldn't have done in the Bush era war powers cases at all. And it seems that the conservatives do not trust executive power when exercised by this president with respect to Israel. It's interesting that this case is being briefed and argued right about the same time as the dust up over uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's visit to the United States at the invitation of Congress rather than the president. At any rate, I think in Zivotofsky, the court stumbles to the correct result, but uh, <clears throat> Hamilton and Washington had it all figured out a little bit better than the Supreme Court did in 2015. Okay. So the third parallel we're drawing is between the Alien and Sedition Act of 1798 and the Sons of Confederate Veterans case in 2015. So let's start with the Alien and Sedition Act. Uh, this story kind of picks up where the neutrality proclamation left off because one effect of Washington's declaring neutrality was to harm US relations with France. And by the time we get to President Adams, uh, those relations are almost at the point of open warfare. So uh, Adams' allies in Congress pass, among other things, a sedition act that says um, you can't publish false, scandalous, and malicious writing that will tend to excite the hatred of the good people of the United States against the US government or the president or Congress. This is the first major test of the First Amendment freedom of speech in US history. And it's a test that we completely flunked. This is pretty much the perfect example of a law that abridges the freedom of speech. It is government suppressing a particular viewpoint that it disapproves of. And the really terrible thing is that all three branches of the government were involved in suppressing it. So Congress made the law, President Adams signed it, and the federal courts went along in prosecuting newspaper editors and pamphlet writers and satirists 
for basically not much more than criticizing President Adams and his policies. So in this kind of situation, what, what, what's supposed to be done when all three branches of the government are conspiring to clearly violate the Constitution, what happens? And there were two important reactions to this. One was the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, which were acts of the state government protesting against the unconstitutionality of these acts and threatening to defy the authority of the federal government in carrying in them into effect, um, which never happened. But these were tremendously influential. They were ghostwritten by James Madison and Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and it provoked an interesting constitutional debate with far-reaching consequences over what kind of authority states had to oppose the federal government. But that's kind of a side note because of the second reaction, which was a popular referendum. The election of 1800, the presidential election of 1800, in substantial part because of the backlash against the Alien and Sedition Acts, drove Adams and most of the Federalists out of office and elected President Thomas Jefferson. So that's what killed the Alien and Sedition Acts even after the whole government was putting them into effect, was that Jefferson was elected president, he pardoned uh, the people who were convicted under the Sedition Act, and life went on. So now we get to fast forward 200 years or so. Uh, we've learned a lot about the First Amendment between then and now, and the Supreme Court has its procedures for deciding cases. Um, but we can still get things wrong. And I think in this case, maybe we did. So this is uh, the case of Walker v. Texas Division, Sons of Confederate Veterans. And it's a much more specific issue than uh, the Sedition Act. It's more of a judgment call as to whether it's constitutional or not. You can make good arguments either way. But at bottom, what's happening is the same. It's government suppression of viewpoints that it disapproves of. So here's the scenario. Texas has a program where it uh, sells people specialty designer license plates. So you can get a license plate with uh, your favorite football team's logo on it, or your school, or the Rotary Club, or you can get a license plate with uh, Dr. Pepper on it, or golfing. So, in the, uh, private groups design these license plates and then go to Texas for approval and there's this panel that says, yes, okay, that design works, we'll put it on the license plate, we'll take your $8,000 and we'll sell you the right to use this design for your license plate. Well, okay, the Sons of Confederate Veterans organization designs a license plate with the Confederate battle flag on it. The Texas panel says, no, no. People will find this too offensive. We won't approve it. Is that a violation of the Sons of Confederate Veterans First Amendment rights to free speech? And it turns out that the answer depends on whose speech these government issued privately designed license plates are. When you see uh, the I'd rather be golfing license plate on a Texas vehicle, is that something that the Texas government is saying? Because the government determining the content of its own messages, that's not violating anybody's freedom of speech. Or are these Texas license plates an expression of the private group speech that chose to design them and put them on their cars. Because in that case, it would seem like the government is targeting the Confederate veterans or organization's specific message and abridging the freedom of speech. And like I said, 
this seems like a judgment call. It's not nearly so blatant as the Sedition Act was. My personal gut reaction is that a license plate really represents private speech more than it represents government speech. It's like a bumper sticker or advertising space on a city bus. And so on balance, I think the correct answer is no. Um, the Texas panel should not have denied this license plate application. So it's not a huge mistake, but it just goes to show that free speech is a difficult thing, especially when it's a matter of government trying to suppress unpopular and rightly dislikable messages. But it raises the worrying question of, does everything uh, have to go, sorry. The Supreme Court decision as it stands raises the worrying question, does everything that go through a, goes through a government approval process now count as government speech rather than private expression? And now we have the big one. As usual, professors have left the best for last, but have left too little time to cover it. So I'll just go into two-minute drill about the biggest Supreme Court decision of the past term, and actually, uh, possibly one of the biggest, most important Supreme Court decisions of the next 20 years. It see, every generation, it seems, has its paradigm-defining case, you know, some sort of landmark case, a decision or a series of decisions that sort of frames the entire jurisprudential debate and the public debate over the role of the courts and the power of judicial review for seemingly 10, 20, uh, sometimes 25 years. You know, Brown versus Board of Education was such a case. Uh, before that, Lochner versus New York was such a case. Roe versus Wade was such a case. Obergefell versus Hodges, the same-sex marriage case, is such a case. And we use it here to pair with the, what has been a long-standing constitutional controversy over the power of courts, the recurrent problem of what is called, rightly or wrongly, judicial activism. Um, and this is a problem that dates to the earliest days of the Republic um, as the Constitution is being debated. One of the most insightful critics of the proposed Constitution is a guy named Brutus. They're all writing under pseudonyms at the time. Brutus says, the real Trojan horse, the danger to liberty, the danger to society in this Constitution is the judicial power. Look at it, that's where the power of the national government is really gonna be brought home to the people. And there's nothing to check them. As a consequence, the judiciary will make the Constitution into whatever they want it to be. They will enlarge national government powers, and their decisions will not be susceptible to any form of correction. And actually, Alexander Hamilton's papers in The, the Federalist explaining the judicial power as the Federalists understood it under the proposed Constitution take pains to deny that. Uh, he says, no, no, the judiciary will be the least dangerous branch. It has neither force nor will, but merely judgment. It has, commands no troops, it can, appropriates no funds, and it must even depend upon the executive arm for the efficacy of its own judgments. Moreover, it would be improper and not legitimate for the judiciary to interpret the Constitution in any way other than in accordance with the natural and obvious sense of its provisions. And he also declares confidently that there's no way that the Supreme Court would do so because it would hazard the wrath of Congress and be subject to impeachment. It's actually fascinating. Uh, Alexander Hamilton contemplates impeachment as the remedy for abuse of judicial decision-making power. Okay. Now, the traditional example that everybody gives from history of the most flagrant abuse of judicial authority is, of course, the Dred Scott case. Uh, if you want to read a magnificent 650-page book on the Dred Scott de decision, it's by Don Fehrenbacher called the Dred Scott decision. Don Fehrenbacher was a distinguished Stanford University historian for a number of decades. It is, for you law students, I think, it, though it is written by a historian, I think it's one of the best books on constitutional law ever written. 
I will give a drastically compressed version of the Dred Scott case story. Dred Scott's a slave in Missouri. He travels with his master, who's a captain in the US Army, who is posted to Illinois, which is a free state, and then to Minnesota, uh, uh, Fort Snelling, which is just a couple miles from, from my house and Luke's childhood home, and where he, federal territory is free territory where slavery cannot exist under the terms of the Missouri Compromise Statute of 1820. Dred Scott eventually returns to Missouri. Captain Emerson dies, and Scott sues Emerson's widow for his freedom. He loses that case in the Missouri state courts, and then he brings a new suit against the administrator of Captain Emerson's estate, a man named John Sanford, who is a New Yorker, invoking federal court diversity jurisdiction, a special heading in which can there be suits between citizens of different states. The litigation goes on for 11 years. What had started as a routine ground ball suit for freedom in 1846 becomes a national cause celeb by 1857, and there have been numerous other events that have uh, 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 aggravated the slavery and anti-slavery tensions in the US since then. It gets to the US Supreme Court. The US Supreme Court says, through Chief Justice Roger Taney, the time has come to resolve all these issues. And he holds in two of the most atrocious dis, uh, holdings ever in US Supreme Court history. First of all, that blacks, free or slave, have no rights under the Constitution, are not contemplated as part of the political community, but were beings of an inferior order who could justly be enslaved for their own benefit. Makes you grimace, doesn't it? So the most atrocious language ever in the Supreme Court history. He then goes on to strike down the Missouri Compromise as unconstitutional on the grounds that it impairs the constitutional right to hold slaves as property. Where does he find this right in the Constitution? There's no right to slavery in the Constitution. There are some provisions in the Constitution that protect slavery in certain respects, a fugitive slave clause, the notorious three-fifths compromise, the non-importation proviso of Article I, Section 8. But there is no freestanding constitutional right to slavery. Chief Justice Taney just makes it up, and he grounds it in the due process of law clause of the Fifth Amendment which says no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. He reads it as a substantive restriction on what government laws can do, not as a procedural protection that government may not take property or liberty arbitrarily without some sort of process or without enactment of a law. He reads it as what is known now as substantive due process. Now this rightly produced a crisis in judicial authority. We tell the story in chapter seven of the rise of Abraham Lincoln and his resistance to the Supreme Court's decision in Dred Scott. The same sex marriage decision presents these same sorts of issues in a radically different context. Now I know and respect that different people, of course, have different views on the social policy, justice, and morality of same-sex marriage. And as I encourage my students, I want you to think about the legal issues as legal issues and not with your political beliefs, right? I tell my students, don't think law with your politics. If your interpretation of the Constitution always lines up with your political views, chances are you're not interpreting the Constitution, you're just projecting your political views onto the Constitution. So before we have screaming matches about same-sex marriage, I'm gonna take it out into the halls and have your fist fights in the corridors of the lovely Stanford University campus. The question of the legal basis of substantive due process is a different matter entirely. The, now, for those of you who may have been living under a rock for the past four or five months, the Obergefell decision creates a national constitutional right to same-sex marriage, overriding the state marriage laws of a number of states that still had limitations to traditional male-female marriage only. Um, <clears throat> the decision grounds its reasoning in the due process clause 
on the doctrine of substantive due process, provoking four different overlapping vehement dissents by Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Scalia, Justice Alito, and Justice Thomas. Now, much has been said about Obergefell, and I think we'll just leave it for the question and answer period to say much, much more. Um, but I think there are at least a couple of points that are striking about the decision. Let me just sort of sketch them and say how, note how they recreate traditional controversies. First of all is this whole idea that it is based in substantive due process. Probably the least defensible, least plausible argument that you, that in a very traditionally discredited argument based upon the Dred Scott decision, but yet one that has had a peculiar resiliency in the Supreme Court because it has become the favorite doctrine for courts pouring their substantive policy preferences into the Constitution. The doctrine is textually incoherent and historically really indefensible to think that the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, adopted in the wake of the Civil War shortly after Dred Scott, was meant to somehow validate the doctrine of substantive due process that the Civil War and the 14th Amendment were in part designed to repudiate. The second thing that's really striking about the Obergefell decision is that usually the court, when it engages in judicial activism, is sort of cautious and restrained and couches things in terms of incremental steps. Obergefell is, I think, a landmark and a new paradigm in that it, it has an unabashed, uh, unashamed, really unrestrained embrace of the propriety of judicial activism in pursuit of justice. That's new. That's new. It's a little different era we're now living in. The other thing that's striking, and I'll close with this, is the extreme stridency of the dissents. The dissents, I think, clearly have the better of the legal argument, but wow, they go further than to say that the majority decision is wrong. They say it is so badly wrong, so akin to Dred Scott, as to call into question the legitimacy of the Supreme Court as an institution. It's really extraordinary near the end of Justice Scalia's dissent, and this is paralleled in Justice Alito's dissent and hinted at at least in Chief Justice Roberts' dissent. They seem to say something has skidded off the rails. The court is no longer capable of controlling itself. Check us. Use these powers to resist and overrule the Supreme Court's decision. Now that's really, really quite extraordinary. I don't think I've seen anything quite like that in the lifetime. Now, <clears throat> that's our short introduction to these series of cases. I think all of them are interesting and important, but 20 years from now, uh, we might not remember the Obamacare statutory interpretation case. We might not remember the name Zivotofsky, we might not even remember the fascinating little Texas designer license plates case, but I think we'll all still be talking about the same-sex marriage case, and it will be one of the most discussed cases in law schools and legal discourse for the next 20 or 30 years. So, thank you very much. I'm going to invite Luke up here so that we can, can we, do we have time for some questions for a few minutes? Come on up. You, thank you. All right, we uh, have time for just a few questions. If you can come up to the uh, mics and keep it short, and we'll cut at about a quarter till and go outside for a reception. Do you mind if I get casual? And... It's not right for California. Necktie and zip top. <clears throat> yes. Yes. Uh, uh, there was, a, I think, a marriage, I'm not so sure about it, in 1972 or 1962, where, wherein uh, a man got married to a woman, but in reality, that woman turned out to be a man. So for the same-sex marriage that is uh, legalized now, will that be a legal marriage retroactively? It will come back 
Uh, Luke, do you want this one? No, no. <laughs> it, it, it sounds like the song, I'm going to date myself here. Well, I've already dated. It sounds like the song Lola. Some of you recognize it? Uh, I have not heard of this situation, but clearly the legal rule has changed. There's now a constitutional right to same-sex marriage. I don't know how that would apply in accidental situations. Um, <clears throat> I, I think that's all I can say on that. <laughs> uh, Scott. Uh, well, well, I guess to, just to stay on this topic a little bit, um, you mentioned, you know, Hamilton and Brutus is back and forth about the power of the judiciary and, well, that you know, they have no troops, they, they can't really enforce these things. You know, we did have a situation that arose in, in Kentucky uh, with this woman, Kim Davis, uh, a county clerk. Um, I, I don't know that I, I'm specifically, you can mention whatever you want about her specific case, but I guess more generically, um, how do you see the, uh, the role of the states, you know, elected officials, other branches of government in potentially resisting Supreme Court cases, which I, I guess you, you kind of alluded to at the very end of your talk. Uh, uh, that's a fabulous question. Do you have another hour? <laughs> I could, I, I, it would be a whole lecture in itself. Let me, you know, there are many times in, in the book in which we're discussing the history of constitutional controversies, in which there's been resistance in a variety of forms to Supreme Court decisions, sometimes justified, sometimes less justified, and they present a range of issues. But one of them is one Luke discussed, Virginia and Kentucky declare state authority to resist unconstitutional actions of the federal government including actions that have been sustained by the federal courts. So you have Kentucky resisting federal law and federal judicial decisions, which is actually startlingly parallel uh, to the, the Kim Davis situation. It's sort of intriguing. Now, I, think, I don't think Kim Davis, the, the, the Kentucky resolutions were ghostwritten, as Luke said, by Thomas Jefferson. I, I don't think Kim Davis is Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> but it is interesting to think about, and actually these historical controversies give you a background and a different prism for thinking about it as opposed to just what you get in today's newspapers. Is it ever justified for state officials to resist what they are fully persuaded are unconstitutional Supreme Court decisions? Now, part of the problem is historically, these, these claimed rights of state resistance have almost always been in the service of causes that most of us would find improper, right? You know, it's secession and civil war, it's nullification, it's resistance to integration, it's, it's George, Wa uh, George Wallace standing in the schoolhouse door. So I think it presents fascinating, difficult, and, and problematic issues. But it's also Thomas Jefferson and James Madison resisting the sedition act. What do you do with that sort of situation? In, in our book, we lay out those problems and say it's not as easy as a conventional wisdom says, because it's also Lincoln resisting the Dred Scott decision and refusing to be bound by it as a political rule. Great question. It, it's, it's one of the ongoing, most difficult questions of, of constitutional structure as to who has the power to, to decide the Constitution. Is it the Supreme Court? no matter what they decide. And that seems quite a bit in tension with the structure of separation of powers and federalism and with much of the evidence of the framers' intention. So, but I'll, but I'll stop there rather than address a specific case. Hi, I'm Brian. So I don't know much law, but if the courts are gonna recognize new rights, why are they looking toward the procedural due process clause rather than what's seemingly the more natural privileges and immunities clause? Well, you know, you know a lot. Do you, do you want to handle this one? I'm not sure what that's okay. like. <laughs> um, there's a, an historical answer, and then, then there's just speculation. The, the historical answer is that shortly after the adoption of the 14th Amendment, in one of the earliest cases interpreting the 14th Amendment, it's called the slaughterhouse cases. 
the Supreme Court adopted an interpretation of the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment that was narrow. It said that it didn't create freestanding, floating, substantive federal rights. And actually, I, I agree. I think we agree in the book that this is probably a correct decision in that the claimed federal right was a privilege or immunity of citizenship to operate a competing slaughterhouse business within the city limits of New Orleans. You know, it's like the weirdest case you could imagine as your context for your first dramatic interpretation of the core substance and provisions of the equal, of the, the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection, Privileges or Immunities, and Due Process Clause. But it seems that as a matter of history, the water is then Flew, you know, flowed this way rather than this way as a consequence of the slaughterhouse decision. And without the ability to rest in privileges or immunities, the Supreme Court, not too many years later, reverted to this idea of substantive due process, of pouring substantive content into what appears to be, I, I think rightly so, a provision about fair procedures and orderly administration of justice. So it's part of why I say it seems the least textually justifiable uh, 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 basis on which the Supreme Court could have invested these rights, but it's something they've done. They keep returning to it. You know, it's like, it's like the monster in the horror movie that keeps getting up no matter how many times it's killed. You say, no way, come on, that thing is dead. There's no way they can do that again. But it has become uh, the doctrine of first resort for judicial creation of new substantive rights, and, and, it, and it probably is the least proper one you could imagine. Thanks. First of all, thank you for your presentation. Could you comment regarding the Supreme Court's uh, susceptibility to increased social pressure and how that may or may not influence the kinds of decisions that they're making, and in particular with you know, some of the um, some of the rationale used in some of the cases that you've presented. Go for it. Increased social pressure. So I think that definitely is an element um, of some of the cases we've discussed. Obergefell is the one that comes to mind. Uh, one of the things that I found interesting about that decision is that the Supreme Court has to explain why it did not find this right to be a right three years or five years previously. And basically what they say is we've come to our senses. We, and th th they go ahead and say that new social trends toward acceptance of same-sex marriage have influenced them. And that's very interesting because on the other hand they're saying that this is now an absolute right over and above anything a state government will do. So I, I think that it would be accurate to say that that decision, for example, is influenced by social pressure. Do, do you, did you want to add anything? No, no, I, I, I think it's clear that the uh, the Supreme Court in many of its decisions as a functional matter, just as a descriptive matter, it pays attention to the social winds and decides cases on that basis. Um, I'm generally of the view, in, in, at least in my academic writing, we try to be a little more detached and sort of lay out the issues in the book, you know, sort of tee them up for people to evaluate for themselves. But I, I'm of the view that, that that's illegitimate, that the idea that the Supreme Court is making social policy based on their perception of what the social winds are is, is exactly contrary to what they should be doing. Their role is to enforce the law of the Constitution and to sustain that immutable vision to the extent that there's social change that should come. Part of the genius of the design of the Constitution is that it permits room for democratic choices that can implement new policies. When the Supreme Court short circuits those democratic choices, I think it's a problem. And that's kind of the, 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 the basis of at least John Roberts' dissent in Obergefell is he says, look, there may be good claims to social justice, 
for same-sex marriage. He says, that's not what this dissent about is about. This dissent is about whether or not the Constitution permits the Supreme Court to act as a legislature and make those and substitute it for the will of the people. He and Justice Scalia say the real issue here is democracy, and when the court makes up new rights that do not have a sound textual basis in the Constitution, they thwart the democratic process, and, and, and you know that's the nature of their objection uh, in, in their dissents in that case. All right, we have time for one more question, and then following the answer, we'll go outside to my right uh, for uh, reception. Hi, so you mentioned um, Chief Justice Roberts' dissent in Obergefell, and I found it, I really would like to hear your comment more on that, on the divisiveness of the court, and how Obergefell will be you know, a case for the next 25 years, and where you think um, the dissent will go. Because when my recollection was, he was really giving his whole body to the dissent. It, he was booming, and he said, the court is now ready to render its verdict on history. And the way it was kind of reported in the media afterwards was actually history is ready to render its verdict on the court um, because of the kind of split between, you know, the majority's dependence on due process clause and then the dissent was just so powerful and so angry and kind of, well, not angry, but, but very visible. You likened it to Dred Scott. Do you think it's going to be a 25-year case or a 100-year case where we talk about it? Well, I, I know that Michael and I, my co-author, have to revise our constitutional law casebook immediately this year to get it in because this, this changes the, the debate going forward. Um, I don't know that I want to elaborate so very much more because one thing a speaker learns is not to stand between people and their reception and, and, no, okay, by speaking too long. <clears throat> um, but, but I think the case is a dramatic one and that's highlighted by the dissents. The dissents are unusually candid, unusually strongly written um, you know, th these guys have knocked down drag outs every year, but this is uh, one that seems to provoke in the contending sides unusually great divisiveness. Now, even if you have a view of the Supreme Court as, as that it is more appropriate for them to engage in a forward-looking justice enlarging constructions of the Constitution, there is at least something troubling institutionally by doing it 5-4, okay? Uh, Brown versus Board of Education, which, which is a landmark, I think, correct restoration of the Constitution, but it was still a dramatic, dramatic decision, was 9-0 unanimous. If you are going to effectuate controversial social change by adopting a new construction of the Constitution, if you, that's your view of the political role, the institutional role of the Supreme Court. Goodness, don't do it 5-4. <clears throat> Sustained by the votes of aging justices on the eve of, you know, a year away from a presidential election, this is going to be a, a battleground issue. And I think that when the, the court sometimes has the view that it will settle difficult, socially divisive issues. And at least, you know, the, the, experience, the lesson of Dred Scott is, is, you know, and I'm not saying that the two are the same substantively, but they're kind of similar methodologically. And they're, they may be similar politically in that even though intended to resolve a difficult social issue, they may just end up inflaming a difficult social issue. So thank you all very much. You've been a wonderful audience. It's been an honor to be here.